<laughs> when she told me when I wore those these shirts, and then that memory on Facebook came up, and she said, "See, I told you. There it is." So she got me back on Hawaiian shirts for a while. So I pull them out of the closet here. Uh, this week, I want to talk about reckless love and. and this is something that was a few weeks ago, I don't know how many of you remember it, but during the sermon there was a quote that I found, and he talked about the reckless love of God. Yeah. So I wanted to get into that a little bit more and dig into that, and it's been on my heart all week. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, before we get started, if you would, just let's just go to the Lord in mm -hmm. prayer. Father God, I thank you so much that we're gathered here today, Lord, that friends and family and loved ones are all gathered together, and this, this is the family of God, Father. I thank you that... We have a place to do this, and we live in a country where we're allowed to do this, Lord. And we can come out here safely and, and welcome each other and love each other and spend our time in fellowship and worship with you. And as we go forward, Lord, I pray that we just open our hearts to hear your words, Lord, and that you would give me the words that you want spoken. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Reckless love sounds kind of strange. We, we actually have... A legal definition of reckless. There's reckless driving. You can be convicted on something like that. So when we think about God, reckless is kind of a weird way of looking at that. But I think there's a really good explanation for that. The definition of reckless is acting without thinking or caring about the consequences. Synonyms would be things like rash, careless, thoughtless, heedless, audacious, unwise. And this reckless love we're talking about, yeah, the, the world would say it's unwise. The things that God did don't make sense to the world. But I don't think it's necessarily the fact that acting without thinking, because obviously God knew what he was doing, but I don't think God cared about the consequences of what he did. He just wanted to love us. And he wanted to love us no matter what. We're going to go into some explanations here. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 says... For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The world looks at what God did as being crazy. Why would you do something like this? Why would you send your son? 1 Corinthians 22-23 uh, said, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Paul writing this in Corinthians knew fully well that from the outside looking in, it made no sense whatsoever. The whole concept of Christianity didn't make sense to the rest of the world. In Rome, they actually got to the point where one of the reasons the Romans really went after the Christians was because of the Lord's Supper. They thought the Christians all claimed to be cannibals. It didn't make sense to them. It didn't make, none of these things make sense that God did. It makes perfect sense to us when we understand God's love. So God's reckless love came in, in three different things he did. First one is an action. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. One of the things about recklessness is that it's an action. You do something recklessly. You are reckless in an action. That action was sending your son. That was, that's a strange thing. The second thing was that it's an unreasonable thing. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might have become the righteousness of God. Again, in the world's eyes, that doesn't make any sense. Why would you sacrifice somebody who didn't do anything wrong for people who did things wrong? We don't ever do that. That's not a human thing. When we say someone's wrong, they pay the consequences. And God said No. You can't pay the consequences, so we'll pay it for you. And then, in the end, the carelessness of this, the fact that God loved us this much, says there's no one who understands, there's no one who seeks God. No one was looking. When Jesus came, it was a surprise. Yeah, they knew about the Messiah and the Old Testament and the prophecy and all those kind of things, but Jesus came when nobody was looking for him. Because in the fullness of God's time, it was the right time to do things. But he didn't do it because people asked for it. He did it because that was the timing. That's when it had to happen. And sacrificing his son was a reckless thing. 
But Jesus himself gave us some really good examples of recklessness, too. And I, that's what I want to go into for the rest of the sermon here. Um, I've told you guys before, one of my favorite characters in the New Testament is Peter. I love the character of Peter because he is impulsive. He's brash. He does things really, really right sometimes and really, really wrong other times. And I have a tendency to kind of identify with that. Sometimes I think I'm doing it right, and other times I think I'm doing it way wrong. And I think we all can fit into that. Um, if anybody Has anybody in here ever watched The Chosen? It's a really, really, really neat series that was put out. It's not on television, but you can find it on YouTube, and they have an app where you can watch it on there. And they're doing The Life of Christ. And the character of Peter, the guy that plays Peter, does it very, very well. You see the craziness. You see the impulsiveness. You see the things he's doing wrong. You see when he does it right, and then he does it wrong, and then he does it right, and then he does it wrong. And when you see that, it's easy to identify with Peter because you see, yeah, I, I might have said that too. Or something like that's come out of my mouth before. Yeah. Well, let's look a little bit at Peter and his relationship with Jesus in the concept or in the context of this reckless love. So, this is at the Last Supper. This is right before Judas betrays Jesus. And they're sitting there, and Jesus tells them, This very night you will fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. He's telling them what's coming next. This is what's going to happen. Jesus is prophesying about what's going to happen and telling them, telling all of his disciples, I'm about to die, but I'm going to be raised again and I'll see you in Galilee. And Peter jumps up and says, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. And Jesus says, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I'll never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Well, Peter was a leader. So if he's saying this stuff, of course everybody's going to jump and say, oh, me too, me too, me too. But Peter's the one that says it. We remember earlier in the Gospel, Peter, Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter said, well, you're, you're the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus said, on this rock I'll build my church. And then immediately afterwards, Peter said something, and Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Talk about a high and a low within a couple of verses. Peter here has a problem. And one of Peter's problems is pride. He's always going to be the first guy. He's always going to be out front, and he's always going to be more committed, and he's, he's promising, I'm going to be there. Even if everybody else goes away, I'll be there. It's a pride issue for Peter. He's challenged by this. He doesn't want Jesus to go. He doesn't want him to, to lose him. But when he's told that's what's going to happen, he rebels against it. I'm not going to let that happen. And we know that even in the garden, he pulled out a sword and went after somebody. Peter was prideful, and he wanted things his way. It wasn't what God wanted, but that's what he wanted. And then the next thing, we know the next thing that happens, just six hours later, six hours later, this happens, uh, Luke 22 tells us that Seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Talking about Jesus. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled the fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, no, You're also one of them. Continuing on, it says, Man, I am not. Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. So they're finding all sorts of ways to try and connect Peter. And Peter is, of course, saying no. And in 60, he says, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. Imagine being Peter now. Just as he is speaking, the prophecy comes through. true. Jesus said, Before the rooster crows three times, now the third time came along, and then, in 61, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Uh -huh. What's going on right now? Jesus is being beaten. 
This is the time that Jesus is getting beaten in the temple. And he looks Peter in the eye when that rooster crows. He looks right at him, face to face. Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today. You will disown me three times. And then Peter realized what happened and he went outside and went bitterly, of course. This is a man who had a close relationship with Christ. This is a man who had been called early in the ministry, had seen everything Jesus did. He was the first one amongst the disciples to say, this is the Son of God. And yet, his pride gets a hold of him. He claims, I'll never do this, and then he does. And I can't imagine the feeling he had when Jesus looked at him and looked him in the eyes. That had to be as ground-shaking a moment and as life-changing a moment for Peter as ever had happened before. It's one thing to follow Jesus. It was another thing to watch the crucifixion and the sacrifice that was necessary for our, for our sin and for our salvation. And Peter added to that by denying him at that point in time. I think that's probably going to be one of the lowest parts of his life. And Peter, being the impulsive guy that he is, probably at that point in time gives up. He's probably feeling really lost. He's not leading anybody now. He probably doesn't think he's worthy of leading anybody now. He probably doesn't think that there's anything worthwhile in him because of what he did. Now, Peter, we know, comes back again. When, when the Holy Spirit descends on, Peter really takes charge and he comes back to him. Why? Because of the reckless love that Jesus shows him. Now, he told him all the things that were going to happen and got rejected by Peter. And I think that rejection, that betrayal, is probably the worst feeling you'll ever get. If someone did that to you, promised you I'll always be there, and then looked you in the eye and said, I don't know you, that'd probably be the worst thing that could happen to us. And yet Jesus forgave anyway. And I think a lot of us, we need to remember that in our daily walks, there are times when we'll stumble, when we know better, when we want to do better, Paul says, even though I know the right thing, my body still does the wrong thing. Even though I know it's right, I still do what's wrong. It happens to all of us. We all stumble like that. And a lot of times we take that and we put it on ourselves and we, we bear down on that, probably the way Peter did, make it our own fault, think about ourselves, self-pity sits in, and we, we just we let the guilt weigh us down. And that's not what Jesus wanted. He didn't want it for Peter. He doesn't want it for us. He loves us enough to say, that's not, what, that's not what I want. It might be what you're doing, but just come back, and that's not what I want. And Jesus does this for Peter again. Peter falls down from his pride, denies Jesus. And then something else happens. In John 21, 1 through 3, Afterward, Jesus appeared to him again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon, Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. So the disciples are still together. They've been walking around together three years. These guys are pretty close. But Jesus is gone. Now in John 20, we see that Jesus came twice. This is an interesting thing. If you look and read John 20, Jesus appeared twice to the disciples. You know, he appeared the first time, and then the second time when Thomas, doubting Thomas, we get the little story about Thomas. But if you look there, in John 20, Peter is never mentioned. Thomas is mentioned, but Peter is never mentioned in John 20. Jesus came and visited twice, but Peter is not mentioned. He never says a word to Peter, and Peter never says a word to him. I got this picture in my mind of Peter standing by the back wall. Jesus shows up and he's probably obviously feeling guilt for what happened. He's probably avoiding Jesus a little bit. And you know what? Jesus let him. Part of this was Jesus allowing for the process to be completed. There needed to be some time in here. 
Peter needed to understand who he was and what, what was going on and what God wanted for him. And he let that time go. But on this third time in John 21, he shows up again. And Peter says, this is, it says right here, Simon Peter, I'm going to fish, Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Now, what does that remind you of? What did Peter do before Jesus called him? He was a fisherman. So what's Peter going to do now? I'm going to go back to what I used to do. He had been involved in God's ministry for three years, walking with Jesus, seeing everything that went on, doing everything. And remember, as we go through the Gospels, it, was, it says that Jesus sent them out and they were casting out demons. They were doing things. The disciples were actually actively doing what Jesus was doing. And now Peter says, I screwed this up so bad, I'm just going to quit. I'm just quitting. I'm going to go fishing. And he takes, and these guys don't have anything better to do, so they go with him. And they fish all night and catch nothing. I probably explained this to you before, but in the Sea of Galilee, they always fish at night. They don't fish in the daytime. They always fish at night because that's when the fish are running and that's where they can get them with their nets. So when Jesus, when Peter was originally called, remember, same thing happened. They were fishing all night and nothing happened. And Jesus said, go put your nets back in. Well, that's during the daytime. Fish don't run, but sure, if you want to. And they caught that huge catch and they abandoned it and followed Jesus. Well, now it's a reset. It's a reset for Peter. They're back to the same thing. They're fishing and catching nothing. Now that in itself doesn't seem like much, but it goes on. Go ahead. John 21, 4 through 7. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. Been out all night, nothing. Early in the morning, this guy says, oh, so how's, how's the fish bite? That didn't catch a thing. He said... Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Okay, reset. This happened once before. Do you remember how it happened? Do you remember what it was? He's doing this so that Peter sees the fact that we're going back to the beginning. We're resetting things for you. And then in 7 it says, Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say this, It is the Lord. He wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. Peter was in a probably the worst spot in his life, the darkest time in his life after this, after losing Jesus, denying Jesus, doing these things. He's just going to go back, and Jesus repeats the miracle of the fish. And then I don't know whether John's eyesight's better than Peter's or whatever. John says, "Wait, that's Jesus." And Peter, in his faith, dives into the water. He's not going to wait for the boat to get back. He's not going to wait till they can row it in or put up the sail or whatever it took. He just dives into the water. He wants to get back to Jesus so bad. I think Peter saw all these things happening. And as it's happening, he's going, wait a minute. I remember this. I remember things like this happening. I remember... The things that I learned that I let go of. And he dives into the water to swim to him. He just wants to get there as quick as he can. As it continues in John 21 here, it talks about how the rest of them row in and try and bring the fish in and they can't. And then Peter grabs it and pulls it in because he's Peter. But Peter wants so much to regain what he lost. And I think at this point in time, he's starting to get the concept of what he did and what he really should have done and what he really wanted to do. He did not want to abandon Jesus. But Jesus died. And he came back and he still didn't really feel like it was time. Now it's time. That time has passed and in his perfect timing, Jesus comes back and says, through your daddy. What Jesus is saying here is, I love you. I don't think the world would understand that, but I think as Christians we have to understand that's what Jesus is saying to Peter. I love you. And I'm going to get you back. I'm going to reset it back to where we started so you see it. 
Because what was in the past is in the past, and what is in the future will be in the future. And today, right now, this is where we are, and I want you back exactly the way you are. Not only did he deny him, but he jumped on the boat and said, I'm just going to fish now. And Jesus said, that's not good enough. I want you back. That's love. Jesus was the party that was harmed in this situation. He was innocent of Peter's betrayal, and yet he's the one that made the first move to go back to Peter. He went back to him and said, I want you back. And here's the beautiful part. And this, I've, I've always loved this little section of, of the Bible. In John 21, where Jesus talks to Peter again. When he actually looks him in the eye again. I love this. Because John 21, 15 through 17 says, When they finished eating, Jesus said to, to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? When he said, do you love me more than these? He's applying to that pride. Do you love me more than these? Remember, Peter said, if everybody else falls away, I'll stay there. No matter what these guys do, I'm good enough. I'm going to be here. And he says, do you love me more than these? These, these passages are pretty deep. Peter answers, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then Jesus said, feed my lamb, my lambs. And Jesus again said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And that's when Peter he probably clicked in his head. Wait a minute, I denied three times and he just asked me three times again. Again, things are, things are clicking and falling into place in his head. And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Now, there's some, I'm going to get into some biblical stuff here, a little bit about the Greek. And that adds even a little more depth to this conversation. So, in the Greek, there are more than, there's more than one word for love. The two main ones that are used here are agape and philo. Agape means to love fully, to love recklessly, to love the way God does. To love completely, completely sold out. The way God loved us because he sent his son. That's agape. Philo is, the love, is to love somebody like a brother. There is a difference. One is much deeper than the other. You can love someone like a brother... But it's not quite the same as that agape love. It's not the same as God's love towards everyone. That's loving someone that is personal, somebody you know, right? We cannot call Jesus our friend if he's not first God. If he is not God to us first, we cannot call him his friend. I think there's a lot of problems in the Christian church today because everybody wants to call Jesus their buddy. Everybody wants to do the huggy, cuddly, friendly stuff and they fail to acknowledge the fact that he's also God. Jesus is God. And that love that we get from God, we got through Jesus. If we can't acknowledge the fact that, first of all, he's God, we won't be able to have the love that we're supposed to have between us and Jesus. Between us and Jesus, that relationship is not brotherly love. That relationship should be agape love. So now let's go back and look at that same passage again. Looking at this now through that Greek, Jesus said, do you love me? He used agape. Do you love me more than these? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He used Philo. Ah. Jesus used agape. And he answered him, yeah, don't you know I'm your brother? Second time Jesus asked, he asked again in agape. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you love me recklessly? Do you love me with everything? And he answers, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now here's the interesting thing. The third time Jesus asked him, he says, Simon, do you love me? He uses Philo. He uses the one that Peter was using. And it says, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time. And when Jesus asked him the third time, he used a different verb. 
Oh, just smile. Oh, Peter, do you, do you love me like a brother now? And Peter was hurt. He hadn't quite grasped this concept of the fact that his life was meant to be devoted completely to God. Forever. Not just for three years, not just for a little bit of time, but his life was meant to be devoted 100%. To follow Jesus the way Jesus led. That was his, that was the goal for him. That's what he was supposed to do. Now Jesus is being incredibly gracious here by taking him back. I screwed up. Bad. And Jesus said, but do you love me? And Peter says, oh, you know I do. You know, you know everything. You know my heart. You know what's in my heart. And Jesus is saying, yeah, I know. I know the emotional feeling you have for me, but you've got to commit your life. It's not enough to say I love you. You have to do it. And dude, you just walked away and got back on a fishing boat. Did you miss what we talked about in those three years? Did you miss the concept of where I want you to go? What I want you to do? And then he goes on. And he recalls Peter. In John 21, 18 through 19, he says, Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. When you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Okay, let's break this into two sections here. The first one is Jesus is prophesying what's going to happen to Peter. Peter is crucified in the end. Peter is helpless physically in the end. He's a very strong man. He takes pride in his strength. He's a guy that works with his hands. He's that, that fisherman guy that went out there and pulled the net in when nobody else could do it. This is Peter. And Jesus says, that's not going to be who you are in the end. This is what's going to happen to you. In the meantime, he says, follow me. And again, in the Greek, this is the emphatic. You cannot say this any stronger in Greek. Follow me. Period. End of story. Demand. Not a question. Not a suggestion. Not a please would you. This is a command. Follow me. This is what Peter, God wants from Peter. I think this is what God wants from all of us. To follow him, we have to do what he did. And that means that reckless love should be part of us. This is what he tells Peter. Dude, this is what's going to happen to you. But anyway, even if that's going to happen to me, your job is to follow me. Period. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. Die to self daily. Follow me. We just sang that song, Footprints of Jesus. Put your feet in his feet. What happened to him? None of us want to have the same ending that Jesus did. But Jesus said it doesn't matter. That's that reckless love. The consequences of you loving someone with the kind of agape love that God wants is not something you should consider. You don't weigh it out and say, well, I love you if this happens. It's a 50-50 sort of thing. A lot of people that get divorced say, well, we, we just have irreconcilable differences and we don't get along anymore. Well, when you first got married, you couldn't get enough of each other. And somewhere along the line, it wasn't as important because I don't get what I want from them and they don't give me what I want and we don't... That's not agape love. Then. This agape love, this reckless love is I don't care. Van and I were talking this morning as, as, as we were shoeing her second horse. And there is a prophet in the Bible that had agape love that people might overlook a lot. That's Hosea. God told Hosea to marry a prostitute who didn't stop her behavior after he married her. And he kept taking her back. And he kept taking her back. Even though the rest of the community were probably mocking him. First of all, telling him, what are you doing marrying that woman? And secondly, when she started doing the same behavior she'd had before, dude, you need to get rid of that woman. And finally, well, he's an idiot. He won't leave that woman. And he doesn't. That's agape love. It didn't matter what she did. God said, marry her and love her. 
She did all those things against him when God said, Mary, I love her. And Jesus is giving us that same example and calling, calling Peter again. Don't just follow me as a spectator. Follow the footsteps that I left in front of you because I'm going and I need somebody to step out. We're all called to be that same person. We're called to do the same thing. We're called to love recklessly. Don't worry about how they receive it. Give it. <coughs> Don't worry about if you get any back. Give it. That's what he's telling Peter to do here. And I think that's what he's telling us as well. Now, Peter has one last little shot. Of course he does because he's Peter. He's got to do one more thing wrong. This is the last time we see Peter and Jesus having an individual conversation. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved, which I've always thought was hilarious because it's John talking about himself. John wrote this and he's talking about himself. He said, well, the disciple Jesus loved. <clears throat> That's me. I'm writing about me. I don't want to put my name in there. So if Peter notices that the disciple who Jesus loved is following him. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had asked, and said, Lord, who's going to betray you? Two things there. Number one, okay, John in his silliness keeps saying, well, the one who leaned against him. That sounds silly, but he saw Peter say, I will never. John <laughs> saw that. John's a young man in comparison to Peter. And John saw... Peter say, I never will, and knew that Peter denied him afterwards. And he's watching. He's writing this down because he's a first-hand witness. He saw this conversation. He saw what was going on. And what does Peter say? When Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what about him? And God said, none yet. That's none your business. Who cares what happens to him? I'm not talking about him. I'm talking to you. Why are you still looking at others? Look at yourself. Jesus said to him, If I wanted to re remain alive until I return, what's that to you? You must follow me. Period. End of conversation. In the end, it's not, it doesn't matter what people think about you. It doesn't matter what people say about you. It doesn't matter what people do in relation to what you're doing to them. It doesn't matter what the guy standing next to you is doing. It's you. Your life, you are responsible. That's what he's telling Peter, and that's what he's telling all of us. We are personally responsible for these things. Jesus is looking him in the eye and saying, you follow me. He's still saying that to us today. That's never changed. Jesus said, follow me. He said, if you are my followers, people will know you by your love. The most important thing is to love God with everything you have, but also love each other. And he's telling Peter, that is agape love. You should love like God loves, not like the world loves. Loving like the world loves is easy. Very easy. How many romance movies do we have? TV shows, books. Romance is easy. It's easy to fall in love with somebody. When everybody's lovey-dovey and complimenting each other and buying each other, that's easy. That's worldly love. And it's a great thing in a relationship. It's a good thing in a relationship between myself and my wife. That, that should be there. But that's not enough in the eyes of Jesus. In the eyes of Jesus, we have to have the love of God, that reckless abandon. Oh, I'm going to love people whether they like it or not. And I've, I've told teenagers that. One young girl in particular who had a lot of problems going on, and it was just a couple of years ago, she was, she was hurting herself in a lot of ways. And I told her flat out, I looked her right in the eye, and I said, you know I love you, and you can't do anything about that. And she smiled, and she cried, and she gave me a hug. Because she understood that I wasn't going to, I'm not going to leave you alone. Things go bad, I'm still going to come back and talk to you about it. I'm still going to ask you how you're doing. Every single day, I'm going to come find you. She finally grabbed that and took it into herself. But understanding that God loves us that much, that you can't sin your way out of God's love, you can't hate your way out of God's love, you can't hate yourself enough that God won't love you, understanding that concept, and then saying, you know what, now I need to do that too. 
That's what he's telling Peter. You need to do it. So to end it up here, I want you to think about these things. In these passages from John 21 that we just read, twice Jesus looked him in the eyes. Once when he was denying him, and once when he was calling him back. Peter, do you love me? He didn't say, do you guys love me? How's the group feeling about it? How's the church feeling about it? No. Jesus said, you, do you love me? And he's saying that to each and every one of us today. You are responsible for you, and what are you doing? Not your family, not your parents, not your kids, not your grandkids. What are you doing? It's a personal thing. He talks to us alone in this. Jesus speaks to us individually, ourselves. Each of us have a different gift. Each of us have different talents. Each of us have a different story. Each of us have a different testimony. Each of us have different things that God has given us in our lives. Everything I've ever had in my life, God gave me. And it's different than other people. Why? Because God wants a personal relationship, and He's going to bless you personally, and He's going to talk to you personally, and He's going to forgive you personally, and He's going to love you personally. And He wants the same from us. It's an intimate conversation. It's an intimate conversation that God has with you. Jesus died for you personally, for you alone. He died completely recklessly for you. Yes, he, he did it so that no one, no one would, would pass beyond salvation. He did it so that the whole world could be saved. But Jesus is looking you in the eye saying, but I did it for you. So what are you going to do in return? I loved you recklessly, and I still love you recklessly. I love you so recklessly that eventually I want you to come back. When this life is over, I want to be with you for the rest of your life, for the rest of eternity, for everything. I want you back. In the meantime, love people. Love so big that there's nothing in your life that's not love. Love so big that there's not room in your life for anything else but love. Be that one who fills yourself with Christ so much that Christ pours out of you onto other people. That's what he was telling Peter to do. We're called to love recklessly and love the way that, other, that Jesus loved us. And in the end, to every, each and every one of us, Jesus is looking us in the eye saying, now follow me. You've seen my miracles. You understand my salvation. You understand why the Father sent me. You understand what God did for you. You understand the suffering, the sacrifice, the crucifixion, the death, the resurrection. You understand that. Just like Peter did. He knew it all. He'd heard it from Jesus' mouth. Right from the mouth of the source, he heard it all. He was a first-hand witness to all everything. And yet, he still stumbled. And just like Peter, if that happens to you, if it is in your life and it doesn't work out, if you have that day when it goes south, Jesus said, come back. I called you once, I'll call you every time. Every time you fall, I'm calling you back. I'm not letting you go. I'm not going to let you go. The Bible says God is a jealous God and he will not let anybody slip through his fingers. Even if they want to slip through. Even if you're a believer and you've accepted Christ into your life and things go bad and you make bad decisions and things, things screw up in your life, Jesus said, yeah, but you're mine now. You're mine. You're not allowed to go anywhere. I own you. Mom. I've Mom. given everything for you. Mom. And with open arms, Jesus will welcome you back, call you again, and say, you know what? Throw your, throw your net off the right side. Let me remind you what, where we were before. Let me remind you where we started from. Let me remind you of the things that you already know. Let me show you what already happened again so you can see it and come back to where you were. Come back to that point where you really understood and were following me. Follow me. By the grace of God, we are allowed sometimes 
as we fall to come back to God. God loved us enough to send His Son, but He didn't stop there. He loved us enough to send His Son to give Him three years of ministry and an entire New Testament in that Bible explaining it to us. And He loves us so much that we can't ever get away from His love. That agape love is bigger than we can be. And Jesus said, if you love like that, if you love like I do, if you love the way God wants you to love, there won't be room for anything else. But if you can't commit to that, then you're not really following me. Follow me by loving the way I love. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much that you loved us. So much that you sent your son to die for us. That his blood would be shed when he did no wrong. He took the penalty for all of us in a way that we couldn't have, even if we wanted to, we couldn't have paid for our own debt. But you loved us enough to say, I know you can't, but I can, and you sent him anyway. And Father, I thank you that Jesus gave everything for us, willingly, openly, open, open, openly just gave his entire life in the most painful the most brutal death that could have happened. He experienced that because He loves us. And Father, You gave us so much more. And You give more to us every single day. Every single day, we arise new in the grace of You. Every single day, when we wake up and we open our eyes and we take another breath, we have one more chance to follow You the way You want us to follow You, to love the way You want us to love, to be who you intended us to be in the beginning, Lord. You give us the grace of another day. And there's, there's days, Lord, when we stumble and we fall. There's days, Lord, when I don't hold my end up of the bargain. There's days when I don't do what I say I'm going to do. There's days when I do what's wrong, when I know what's right. Oh, and Father, we just praise you so much for the grace to come back to you and say, oh, I need you again. I need to go back to where I was. I need to reset, Lord. I need, to, I need you to call me again. And Father, in your grace, you always pick us up and wrap your arms around and say, oh, welcome home. Now, Lord, we, we struggle with that because we don't understand that the depth of that love and, and how big your love is. And how you don't care about the consequences. You just want to love. Sometimes we don't understand that, Lord, and I just pray that each and every one of us be convicted by the Holy Spirit to see that, to see that love, just to get the understanding of how deep and how wide your love is. And then, Lord, just pre please help us to put our feet in the footsteps of Christ and to move forward and truly, truly follow you. Bless us this week, Lord, as we go forward, Lord, and help us to just remember these things and to remember the love that you have and the love that you want us to give. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.